Live from San Francisco, California, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering DockerCon 2015. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media, with special thanks to Docker. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in San Francisco for DockerCon. This is SiliconANGLE Media's theCUBE, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal noise. I'm John Furrier. My guest co-host today, Brian Gracely, um, Cloudcast, welcome, welcome to uh, co-hosting. Yeah, and John Willis, me. technical advantage of Docker. Welcome to theCUBE. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah. So we're like live, but this is like a podcast, <laughs> live uh, podcast yeah. here. Um, Hi, Mom. <laughs> can't take it back. Once yeah, this goes yeah, live, yeah, yeah. I've made many blunders on theCUBE. Yeah. Um, so I got to get you guys' take on the news here. What's the what's the hot news around the Docker containers and the network? We heard Solomon talking about plumbing, the OCPs out there. You guys talking about plugins, Prydos, us going live. Uh, John, tell us what's what's the new new update there. Well, so the, uh, to me, you know, I mean, um, you know, my focus has really been on, you know, I, so I, I I was part of the Socket Plane acquisition. I was one of the founders of Socket Plane, and what we were trying to do is um, kind of bring bring native SDN to Docker. That was our whole mission, right? Uh, very much open vSwitch, uh, native uh, architecture. So we got acquired by Docker. And so one of the things in our story, at Tucker Plane, it was very much a David and Goliath story. Right? We were going to go after the big guys. Yeah. Like we were going to go to the biggest enterprises and go say, this is how you do containers at scale. Because the, the, you know, the, as anybody could see, right, like containers are great and our basic network structure works, but if you saw the future of where this is going, the density of compute on a host, right, which is the new edge, right, um, it's, it wasn't just gonna, wasn't going to work, and we saw that very clearly. Yeah. So, uh, when we got in, acquired by Docker, um, the idea was that yes, we love what you're going to do. We love your team. Madhu Venkapal was, was our main architect, and we had some ex Cisco people. Um, and by the way, Madhu was one of the, the original committer on Open Daylight, right? And um, and and they said that's great, but what what we need to do is Docker is a big and bigger story, right? Like. That we have customers that are going to want network connectivity with ACI in Francisco. We're going to want customers that are going to want network with v VM, yeah. you know, VMware and the NSX, right? And then Weave and, and all those things. So what, what the team did really for about, um, somebody's giving me eagle eyes over there, but uh, what the team did for the last three months, which is pretty amazing what they accomplished if you listen to the announcements yesterday, um, they basically built what we were trying to do as a David and Goliath story as a general purpose architecture for the future of networking with Docker. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about what, um, what that team has delivered. Um, you know, one, uh, you know, we talk about um, standards or people able to work in conjunction, right, with all the complexity of integration. We, we have this plugin architecture, and that was a core c concept that, that we built an abstraction layer, and this, this primary abstraction layer is a new project on GitHub called Lib Network. And all the network people are very excited about this. And the nice thing is, Lib Network actually built a separation between Docker. Docker was very tied to network componentry. You started a network a Docker container. It created a network namespace. I mean, it was it was very tightly coupled. And there was things about that that involved the application developer in a world they should never have been involved. What Madhu and team have done is built an abstraction layer in between the Docker container and the drivers and it's called Lib Network, it's a service abstraction. And so now what you have is, the server abstraction takes care of all the glue between anybody wanting container. If I want a container and I want to move it from this work network to this network network, um, everything happens at the Lib Network service abstraction. And if the network in production is NSX, and it's Weave in, in some other um, test ground, or all that stuff is completely separated from the Okay, database. so yesterday we reported Stu was here. Stu would be, by the way. Happy. Yeah, Stu would be. Stu would love you. Oh, but like, oh my God. He'd be banging the table yeah. right now. So, but the big, the big three things from yesterday that I took away was uh, open container standard, right. okay, the cross-network host support, cross-host support networking, and, and the plugins. Tease that out. Explain those three things and how they relate, because I kind of got lost. Is it networking? Where's the plumbing? So okay. break those three things down. Container standard, uh, cross-host networking, and then the plugins. So I'll work them in reverse order. Um, so the plugin okay. architecture is something that um, the Docker has been working very hard at for um, quite a while now. Uh, it started with storage, and um, and then when again when Socket Plane came in with a, a network story, it was okay. We need to use that similar architecture plugin for network vendors. So the whole plugin architecture is again a very much. Think of it, um, there's, there's plugins going on for storage, plugins for other, but in the network space, um, in general, oh, let me step back. In general, the plugin architecture is really, we got a batteries 
included, or you plug in this for storage, you plug it in for network. And so that's the plug-in story. There is a, a specific network plug-in storage, which is what I described earlier, with each of the vendors like NSX ACI. So that's plug-in. It's very compatible, anybody can plug and play. Um, the network, which is the second part of that, was this lib network. This yeah, lib okay. network introduces um, an out of the box, batteries included, multi host support, support. That's one of the things you didn't have. This is what we, our first order problem at Soccer Plane was to solve the container multi host networking. And, and so, what Lib Network has done now is you have your default bridge network, but you can also out of the box specify an overlay network. And the overlay network will actually, out of the box, batteries included, allow you to create overlay VXLANs. And voila, as of yesterday, we have full support for um, VXLAN uh, multi-host support. So that's awesome. that. And I'll be quite honest with you, I've been so focused on the network, I have yeah, yeah. not been focused on the OCP. I don't, Brian, well, you might be able to add a little I, more. I, than I think the way I look at it is, is you know, as Ben has said a bunch of times, the big theme this week is, is Docker and production. Yeah. In order to do that, you know, there are so few green fields, everything's sort of some shade of greenish brown. You've got to be able to work with a lot of things, right? So the plug-in thing is really important because people will say, um, I can do some new things, but I also want to, to work with what I have, right? Um, nobody wants to be locked in, at least in theory, you don't want to be locked in, that's the whole batteries and pluggable. And then I think the other thing that came out of all the announcements, whether it was yesterday or today, and you're wearing a DevOps shirt, right? DevOps is this great theme or concept, and but people don't always know like, how do I get there? I think Docker laid out this really nice model that says like, here's the technology, here's the build, run, ship concept, and, and here's how you sort of lay all those things out and you can, you can kind of see the blueprint for how to do that. Yeah, I mean, we, it was, you know, I think all the gaps, you know, all the gaps, I mean, we're a two year old company, but, but um, two and a half year old company, but a lot of the gaps got filled yesterday because again, when you thought about networking or you thought about your network specific solution or you thought about, um, you know, I mean, the, 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 from networking or from storage or, and, and, and even from a delivery standpoint in terms of, you know, what if people want to use other container solutions, right? So um, now it is really, you know, if you think about Docker is putting almost the canonical Linux chain in place, I can plug and play any piece of it. You know, the whole beauty of the original Linux toolchain model was, right, that every section of it was plug and play. Right. plug and play, and we, we, we've kind of have that now for compute, we have our network, you know, we have our storage. So we got some commentary from the uh, crowd chat um, around the plugins, multi-tenant, restart patching, no need for that, what's the take on that? There was a comment, I saw from someone from Docker, and said plugins don't need a patch and are multi-tenant, what does that mean? Well, the, um, so I'm not sure, I'd have to leave a little more context about the don't need a patch. Um, I get, oh, well, so I, I think I'm, Thinking, I'm assuming what the question means. If you want to use multi-network, uh, multi-host networking support today, it's in 1.8. So our current release is 1.7. It's in 1.8 experimental. So that means you can download. We have a blog. In fact, I'm going to do some videos on it this, morning, this afternoon. But um, we ha we have a blog article that tells you how to do install from experimental. You'll actually be running an early release of 1.8. Um, if you know that our uh, release cadence is every two months, 1.7 was dropped what, about a week ago. So if you figure out two months from now, you'll see one day drop. Probably, I'll probably get beat up by somebody, but <laughs> I would say 1.9 will probably, no commit from my side, be a stable release for this. So if you want to start playing yeah. it right now. Well, okay. the, 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 the really powerful thing about this is, and, and this is the Docker portability piece, right? If if you're the production team, you run, you could run Docker 1.6, maybe 1.7 or whatever. If you're the team that wants to go experiment with things, it's it's all software. If I want to go run it as an experiment on AWS, I can go do that and emulate the environment and then, and you talk about this, it's, it's immutable, it means it's, it's consistent. I can then bring that back into my production environment exactly the same and that that's so powerful. Um, I don't think people totally grasp it, but that concept of sort of dev and test and prod is, is yeah. so consistent and run it anywhere. I think, you know, again, focusing on the network side, but I think it, it's a common theme is, you know, Madhu says that I wanted, we want to do for networking what Docker did for compute, right? So that, yeah. that to your point, right, that-, that Make it easy, it really well, and, makes and it easy. They don't have to actually worry about yeah. any of that. They yeah. really literally, you know, again, I, I don't have to sit down and have discussions about, are we going to choose NSX or Cisco for networking, the application people really won't have to worry about that. We, we say that's true, but if you go to a large organization and you go sit through a bake-off between a new Azure or a Cisco versus NSX, everybody in the building is in those discussions, right? Yeah, yeah. In this model, the truth is, the delivery model is, with the plug-in architecture, 
that the application people really don't, they, like what this says, all they worry about is services. Yeah, yeah, I totally, this is the new, this is what, to your point earlier, this is the new normal, and your, your kickoff comments around your vision of the company before it got acquired was, we're gonna take on the big guys, the big whales, and, yeah. and disrupt the hell out of them, yeah. and, you know, and innovate. Yeah. So I gotta ask you guys both, this innovation cycle that's upon us, I was speculating on the kickoff, like, this is the beginning of the front wave. So what's that new normal? The num numbers are clear. Look at Amazon's numbers, even Oracle's throwing some numbers out, it's a big guy. There are, our growth is phenomenal. This, the consumption by the customer is no brainer. They're not going to buy oh. servers and storage separately. It's all kind of going to be integrated. So this huge ease of use theme, code that runs, <laughs> they don't want to buy separate code bases. And they got cloud now as an opportunity with economics and performance. So performance and economics are the, the key things. So what are the key things from your perspective that's going to really throttle the straight and narrow on the innovation? Is it, is it, the, is it the containers? Is it the network? Is it the management? I, all of the above? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I'm a DevOps guy. I've been a DevOps guy. I was at the inaugural DevOps days. I was one of the core founders of DevOps days in the U.S. Um, so I always say that there is always a cultural afoot that has to happen, right? They, yeah. Like in, in order to change your mindset about delivery, um, that's the biggest problem, right? Change from a, a monolithic legacy model of, you know, to a cooperative. Yeah. So that's, you know, so let's get rid of that. But after that, then there is this incredible convergence of containerization, microservices, and data gravity. And I talk a lot about a lot yeah. about this. And and so what you see that you know microserv so microservices and containerization are of just a natural fit. Like and microservices um, to the application development world is really just uh, SLA version. Two. Define microservices from your perspective. People have different vet definitions. Yeah. What is microservices? So microservices really um, there's um, there's a really good book on Riley um, by Sam Newman um, called microservices. But um, if you had to boil it down to two definitions, one. Um, I think Adrian Krakow has probably the best definition. He says it's a loosely coupled, service-oriented, um, and I won't remember the exact, uh, with bounded context. And and the key two points there is loosely coupled and bounded context. Loosely coupled means that you are building. So if you think of those two things. I think you can get your definition clearly. Loosely coupled, you're you're, you're defining an architecture of delivery of software such that. Um, I, I'm creating my own kind of business-related services, and you can use Java. And you, can they see me point? Yeah. Uh, you just call me Java. Bob. Yeah, Bob. Solomon's <laughs> calling me Bob. Bob can you use. You can use Java. You can use Python. You can use Ruby. Like we've completely decoupled the monolithic of how we deliver things. If your group finds that this framework is good, that's great. So that's one part of it. Um, I think there's um, the second part of it is is uh, bounded context. The bounded context goes all the way back from what we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years about software development, yeah. uh, domain-driven domain dr development. Context. And cohesiveness or in, um, in functionality. So it becomes, the you start running in on this idea of building a bounded context around a business piece of code. I've got a certain business piece that I need to solve, mm -hmm. that's the bounded. Can you describe that serve, that code as a business service? So if you, if you couple, loosely coupled, with bounded context, um, and, and then Sam Newman, who is the author of the book, says, by definition, it's small, <laughs> right? Um, I think you throw that together, and there's a lot more. It's 10 years of, of thought leadership around development from guys like Martin Fowler and, and, and people at ThoughtWorks, yeah. uh, domain Eric, uh, Eric, Evan, Eric Evans or whatever, the domain-driven development, um, uh, Heroku's 10-factor. Um, Tim Crawford calls it SOHB2. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> so, I, 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 I think here's the real takeaway. So, so you look at who is the, the, the customer speakers this week, right? So you have a few that are unicorns, but you have Capital One, you have GSA, you have uh, some other. The, the takeaway is, um, doesn't matter what business you're in now, anybody who's a line of business manager, somebody with a great idea can go off. There's no friction to, to doing idea to execution. And I mean, you guys are a great example. You were six, seven, eight people. You're going to go bust up a humongous industry, right. but you could be in banking, you could be in government, you can be in energy. And the ability for you to go transform or even just disrupt an area, it could be just one project. When there's when there's such low friction, whether it's containers and microservices or it's you know, using public cloud, that changes all the economics. It changes the speed yeah. of the game. And that's and once that speed starts happening, um, you know, th then yeah, you, you have, have to reset yeah, everything. You I have to think, reset um, all your yeah, thinking. We've used the phrase in cloud computing, Jevons paradox for a while. And I know Bernard Goldman just wrote a. Um, an article about that, but but going back to the, if you take that kind of yeah. convergence of microservices and containers, there's an insatiable need. There are a bunch of SLA pe 
people that are just waiting for a framework or yeah. a technology to deliver something. They've they, now containers just it busts out. It's basically it's just like breaks out of the box. Right. Exactly. And, and the, but the third piece is just as important in, in, in this exponential growth model we're going into, which is um, data gravity indirectly IoT. Right. So what you find is uh, Brian Cantrell for Joint talks about like we're going to get to a point where you're not going to be able to move the data. Right. So what the whole paradigm of how we do compute, you know, classically in our industry we yeah. move we move um, data to compute. We even use load balances and all that. When we get into these like just swarms of analytics and data that we're going to start collecting in IoT, and we are collecting, yeah. banks fraud, internal fraud, all this stuff, um, it's going to be harder and harder to move data. So now what we're going to do is, and this is uh, Dave McCrory's theory of data gravity, is that what you, in simple terms, you basically start moving compute to data. So you think about your, your yeah. uh, your geography of data. Well, this is your density point. Right, exactly. So you yeah. and so now think about this convergence of microservice bearing the contract, containerization, a very small, we're talking about things that instantiate at 500 milliseconds, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And now the idea that I might want to run a thousand of these in some geographic yeah. <laughs> area around the world, yeah. and then run a thousand of these some other geo, and then aggregate almost like yeah. a macro app. I mean, it, it totally nailed it. I mean, I agree with you 100% on this edge of the network, yeah. because what does that mean now? It's everything. Yeah, and, and the edge of the networks are, are a multifold. those three things change everything yeah. about what we're going to be doing over the next five, ten years. All right, I'm going to take a philosophical question. Let's step back. Let's yep. kind of smoke the peace pipe and kind of look at the big picture. <laughs> the big picture is every time there's been an architectural change, in the industry. Massive opportunity has been enabled. I mean, I mean, I mean real architectural change, not the dot-com bubble. That was just, just yeah. BS, right? That was the, the fundamental web services was developed. No underlying infrastructure changes. Infrastructure shifts. Client server, mini computers, let's go PC, internet networking. We are, cloud is that now. I mean, essentially that. So I want to get your take. What is going on right now in your minds as industry participants that is a radical and or changing underlying infrastructure? Is it the fact that the hardware vendors are selling boxes? Did Converge really play out? Is that really an underlying shift? So what's the big picture in your mind? What is the underlying radical infrastructure change? I, I think we're, so this is going to sound really crazy, but what the hell. Um, I think we're hitting version two of everything that's happened over the last two years. We're hitting version two of cloud. It's called containers. We're hitting version two of SDN. I'd like to think it's live networks. Yeah. Um, we're hitting you know version two of, um, SOA, right? All this is converging right now, right? Like, it, we, you know, what? Let's let's face it. Five years ago, the world. Six, seven years ago, when Amazon put a stake in the ground, the world changed, and we've been in this learning curve for like five, six, seven, whatever it was, whatever two thousand seven. Yeah, just say eight. seven years. Yeah, right. And seven year itch. We've been in this crazy kind of learning opportunity, and I do think. I agree with you. I, so I was there. I'm an old guy. Yeah. I actually started out on IBM mainframes working for Exxon. I was a system programmer on IBM mainframes doing assembly programming um, at Exxon. And I watched that whole distributed compute happen where those mainframes were getting literally you know, crowbarred out of the, the building. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and people we, move into new skill sets, mind, we, mind we change. Went to that was a major, I, the, the internet bubble was interesting. <laughs> But, it but there's was no not, underlying. It didn't there's no underlying. No. I agree. I, I think what we're seeing right now is this uh, this opportunity for you know, again. I'll go back to the data gravity, microservices, containerization. I think this is a fundamental shift in what um, what we're going to look like from an infrastructure perspective over the next two. And five do years. you think that companies that don't adopt cloud are going to be completely missing oh, the boat? So I, yeah. I do a presentation called. Um, so I. A presentation I've been doing called Guns, Germs, and Microservices based on <laughs> Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, yeah. Steel, if you yeah. haven't read that book. Great. And yeah. he talks about the haves and the have-nots. Yeah. I firmly be, believe that the new Guns, Germs, and Steel is um, microservices, containerization, and data gravity. Yeah, and, and, and the footprints are changing. So you say on-premise, cloud, yeah. The old telephone closet days, go back to showing our age, that is, could be the data center now. I mean that you don't need to have the big data center. Well, cloud is here. The economics are unrefutable. I yeah, mean, and we haven't even you know. talked about like what's happening with density of hardware, right? Yeah. Hardware and telemetry yeah. coming from you know, Intel's putting almost everything on their chip now. Acceleration. I mean, um, you know, the 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 the, the, the hardware is just going to you know the com We saw this uh, this. Um, don't put me on a podcast. You. You gotta well, get me speak forever. I, 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 mean, <laughs> I mean, you've got the economics are. The, the That's little, good. The cube the, is just live podcasting. I mean, the, the economics are the, the the little guys can get money, 
then you've got the, the numbers of, of the community that help build that thing. So they don't have to own the developers. They don't have to be a huge company. And they don't care what the old guy's rules are. They're going to go so, drive forward. They actually are sort of building the new rules and all the, the large, older companies are going like, I, I, so, how do I play? And so you get these, like, the, there's there's no friction in theirs, and there's tons of friction on the other side, and it's well the I software mean, guys the, the are, are competing so against the hardware. I worked for IBM right out of school, and then HP in the 80, late eighties, early nineties, and you know we were an HP shop, we were an IBM shop. There's no shop anymore in no. my mind. So what I'm at, what I'm worried about is all these hardware guys. There's, I mean, talk about architectural change, you know. Well, if, they're not I, unaware of this. Well, though, right? it's, like, so, so the it's question, the top. question it's, for you guys as thought leaders is, is this: Where's the hardened top? And I had this argument, um, or not an argument, but a conversation last night with Dave Vellante about this. Do you care that it's an Intel or AMD processor? Yeah, at some point, Intel was a good processor and and it worked. But there's a lot of proprietary code. It's a hardened top. Is cloud going to have a hardened top? And where is that? Because the commodity's happening. I agree, but it's not a race to zero. The sh the value will shift to the well, apps. So the question is, where's that hard? Yeah, I mean, top? I think abstraction is already the value, right? I mean, to to your point about um, you know what you can do now, how cheap, right? So I'll give you a, a as you said that, I, I just thought of an interesting meta point, right? So there was a company um, about five years ago called Flightcaster. There were a couple of ex quants, right? Like Wall Street uh, quantitative analysis guys, right? And they just wanted to get out of the business, right? And they got it, they did a um, this like. Um, Funded, um, I, what do you call them? The, the accelerator. They were in one of these accelerators, and they built this thing called Flightcast, where they did flight predictions, um, and they did it all on. They did it on Amazon. They used the dupe. They used a whole bunch of Erlang. They used like really cool technologies, Co closure, everything. And I got them. On, I used to. I still. I used to do a cloud cafe podcast. I don't do it anymore. And I got him on the podcast, and I said, "How much did this cost?" And it was like one hundred eighty, two hundred thousand dollars, right? And and the thing was. And, and, and it took them like four months to do it, right? And I, I used to go out to conference presentations and I'd say, this is the world looks. And I'd say, imagine if Delta and American Airlines and all got together in collaboration to do this. i say it would take them three years, it probably took them 10 million. Guy comes up to me, asks one of the presentations, you're wrong. Because I work for American Airlines. I'm like, oh. It'd right. be 20 million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'd be 20 million. It'd be three. But here's the thing. I was a judge for the Dakar, Dakar Hackathon this weekend. There was this one project, there was about three or four projects, the, the three winning projects. One of them just blew me away. Um, and um, so, and they came in like third. And I asked them, just like, it made me think, out of curiosity, how much did that cost you guys? So they built in 30 hours. They went ahead and it cost them $80 in, yeah. in Amazon fees. And they built a product that literally probably could get funded tomorrow um, and has an eight value. Now, why does it have that? Because it was on the shoulder of giants, right? Yeah. The, the, again, back to the Jevons paradox. They've got a supercomputer in the they cloud. Had, they had, you know, they had Amazon. They had Docker yeah. containers. They had Docker files. They were using all the Docker latest tools. They were conductors of code. I mean, they were essentially spinning up resources like it's nobody's but business. But that's the world we're in. Right I now. totally agree. I totally agree. All right, guys, we have to wrap there. But I want to get your final thoughts, both of you guys, and I want you to share with the audience, the folks who are not here on site in San Francisco who might be watching remotely, what is this show all about this week? What's the big takeaways? You could share some color around the important things going on here to show the vibe, just your point of view. Well, it's, it's Docker, 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 right? That, that's the track I run, right? I've been emceeing the Docker. But the thing is that Docker's for real. Um, the way Solomon and Ben and the team are thinking about how to do this is real. The government is playing. You know, first, I love when Scott Johnson said, you know, I've I known Scott from... Uh, Puppet and many of his startups before, and he got up and said, our first commercial customer is GSA, right? So the, my takeaway here is Docker is for real. Where it's not a, it's not like like if you're sitting outside, oh my God, all the tweets from Docker. I mean, yes, you know, we're pretty excited about yeah, it. Yeah, it's intoxicating. But yeah. but, but yeah. Um, it's real. I mean, what yeah. we're doing here and what we're doing technically, what we're presenting, um, we're going to have one in the EU. We'll have one obviously next year. I I say, you know. Get your bot over to DockerCon because it's. Uh, I don't think there's a. There's it's a small community face. is growing very there fast. There's an unhappy face in this hallway. Yeah, no. Brian, right, your to, thoughts? To me, to me, it's it's two things. There's a massive blending of, of devs and ops. So I mean, you walk around and, and it, it is blended together. It's not a segmented show, and there are so many people excited about like I can go build apps to do drive something for my business. And I mean, like just that excitement of going like I'm going to go affect yeah. the top line of my business is. Amazing, and obviously yeah. the, the numbers of the show are, but, are packed. It's, it's crazy. I love, I love the quote from the business intelligence guy in the in the keynote this morning. He said, "He said why we chose Docker, 
it was fun. Yeah. And it this worked. business is an insider, worked. right? And it worked. Yeah, that was his second more important. But, yeah. but the, the fact that he said that it was fun, I'm like, yes. Yeah. Like, there's got to be that As element. Stu Miniman from Wikibon says, it's the center of the universe. It's really app-focused. All the energies around the good things in life, yeah. right? Yeah. Fun, cross-portability, compatibility, no lock-in. Yeah. Creative yeah. ideas, all those So things. this is the Docker. It's free love. It's a, I call it the Woodstock of uh, developers. It really is a, it's a cool environment. People are cool. Things are getting done, and there's a ton of opportunity. It's at the beginning, so we'll be more, more coverage from the Cube after this short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>